All right. Yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, first off, uh, any questions from anybody about sort of where we're at, where we're headed, any of the stuff that we've covered up to this point? Doing pretty good about this? Okay. Um, remember, uh, again, that this last quiz, quiz uh, seven is mandatory. So if anybody asks you, says, hey, I'm in your psychology class, is this mandatory? Say, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, one, and make sure everybody knows that so no one uh, tries to skip this one or, or anything like that. Um, again, we've got a lot of time. Uh, quiz uh, seven will be the last Wednesday of the semester. So uh, we've got break and all you got lots and lots of time to study for this, but uh, just make sure to go through and prep for this uh, just because this is the last quiz. This last quiz will go on your average with stuff. OK. All right. Uh, we finished up last time uh, talking about different cultural formation formulations and different considerations when we're thinking about disorder uh, and treatment and how symptoms may play into people's lives essential, essential, essential that we take into account sort of cultural background stuff that goes through and starts to uh, impact uh, feelings of distress, parent coping, and, and all those types of things. So we talked about uh, considerations of the cultural identity of the individual. Um, now, a lot of this times this is a uh, racial ethnic background, but it can be all sorts of other things. It can be um, uh, uh, religious identity. It can be uh, occupational, like lo occupational identities, lots and lots of things. Okay. So wanting to take sort of that person's culture into account when we're thinking about, uh, how this individual is working in the world. Also, uh, want to take, uh, the way people, uh, in different cultures might start to, uh, express, uh, certain types of distress, right? Uh, within, when working with some people, some people might not say I'm depressed. Because I just don't, I don't understand sort of my feelings as depression. I might say I'm, I'm nervous or I'm feeling run down or something along those lines. So taking into account how uh, different uh, individuals from different communities might uh, differ in their way that they're uh, communicating distress. Also want to think about uh, how psychosocial stressors and cultural features start to impact vulnerability and resilience. OK, uh, so if I'm working with someone from, uh, say, you know, white majority Western culture um, and they've got a problem with a family member, you know, maybe my uh, solution is, well, I guess that family member is not uh, contributing. They're kind of uh, uh, actually causing you quite a bit of stress. So maybe you need to start uh, distancing yourself from that person because they're sort of kind of toxic and they're not helping you out, something like that, right? Well, that's maybe fine uh, if I come from majority individualistic white Western sort of America. But uh, in some cultures, distancing myself from my family is not an option for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, and so it might be important that uh, to take that into consideration. So I'm not telling somebody like, oh, hey, this is the solution. And that may be a, a solution from uh, one perspective, from sort of one uh, approach. But within the context of my cultural identity and things, that might not be an option or an optional, optimal option for dealing with a stressor or things along those lines, right? Um, and so taking into uh, cultural features of uh, risk factors, uh, resilience, coping, and things like that, and pulling all that together to make sure that uh, we have a strong understanding there. And then appreciating cultural aspects of the relationship between the individual and the clinician, right? Um, we can't do anything about our background, our culture, and things along those lines. And sometimes there are things that uh, may come up as uh, uh, barriers, and this is uh, can be a, a an uncomfortable thing for a clinician, right? Like I don't know uh, if you come from a community I'm not familiar with. Uh, how do I how do I know? How do I learn and and ask? And so maybe I am embarrassed to ask or don't want to offend somebody, and so I don't ask. That's generally problematic because then that's going to go through and, and perpetuate things, right? Um, but even some subtle things, right? Recognizing that uh, there's a power difference uh, between uh, our uh, the people we work with and you know the clinician. You're you're the doctor, right? You're the the expert, right? Um, and things that you sort of may think are normal um, might start to produce unintended bar barriers, uh, sort of with. Uh, the people you're trying to work with. So, for example, 
uh, you know, as a graduate student, worked with um, uh, impoverished co uh, community in the uh, um, in in the South, uh, and thinking about working with people from really low SES uh, coming in. Um, if I'm dressed to the nines, right, I'm shirt, tie, sort of everything sort of suited up, right, and I'm working with people from very, very poor cultural area, right, uh, just the way I dress and present myself may start to become a barrier because it makes that power differential uh, even more uh, apparent than probably sort of it already feels coming in to talk with an expert about psychological and mental health stuff, right, and so recognizing that some things that we might not even mean to do can start to create barriers uh, with the people we're working with and trying to be mindful of that. That's not saying I'm uh, coming into to sessions in uh, sort of my standard cargo shorts and, and t-shirt, but recognizing that maybe I don't have to be dressed up uh, sort of black tie event type of thing, because that might start to impact sort of the uh, sort of that, some of that rapport. Okay. So uh, thinking about, because then if someone's not interested in, uh, uh, if someone's not interested in sort of or comfortable telling me everything that I don't have all the information starts to become hard to, uh, uh, implement treatment, uh, it becomes uh, hard to, uh, sort of get uh, diagnoses and stuff like that put together. And so, um, uh, all of this, uh, starts to become important. Okay. Got a, a question. Um, FCS. Um, something just came up in the chat box asking about what what does FCS stand for? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not seeing that anywhere. Am I missing something? You mentioned oh, it earlier. Oh, FCS. Uh, um, SES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. SES, not FCS. <laughs> it's my own my own uh uh inability to communicate in in the english language yeah uh s e s right um uh because maybe right um if i'm uh coming from a impoverished community something like that i may not be a hundred percent comfortable with experts and doctors and and uh people who think they're fancier than me um, and if I'm doing things to start to make that uh, existing uh, difference more and more apparent, that can start to become problematic. So just being mindful of some of these things uh, and sort of taking that into account. Okay. All right. Uh, so last thing we're going to cover uh, is an issue that comes up when we're talking about diagnosis, clinical work, this idea of labeling. Okay. Again, remember that when we started this lecture, we started with uh, a perspective um, on disorder that disorders aren't even a real or useful concept, right? Uh, the idea that uh, disorder is used as a way to exert social control over uh, people who uh, sort of may be engaged in uh, behavior or people who are who's just sort of their lifestyle doesn't fit into uh, sort of what we think is appropriate for society, things along those lines, right? And so Similar to this, the idea is that labels, when we start attaching labels, they do more damage than good, okay? And this is a tough question, right? There are advantages of having labels and being able to put a name onto, onto different types of symptoms and conditions. One, starts to be important for professional communication. If I'm working with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder here in Wyoming, uh, and Hannah, you're in Germany, um, and you're also working on traumatic stress. Uh, if I say post-traumatic stress disorder, and you say post-traumatic stress disorder, and we're all working from the same type of thing, we at least know that we're talking about the same thing, right? So for professional communication and clinical research, it starts to become very important that if we have a cluster of, of symptoms, if we're talking about OCD or bipolar disorder or something along those lines, uh, what I want to make sure is that my version of that is not different than your version of that, because otherwise there's no way to compare and contrast and communicate information, right? Um, if I'm working with a client, that client transfers to somewhere in the U.S. and starts working with somebody else. If I say uh, I was working out with this person on X, Y, and Z issues, we all know what that means. We're on the same page. 
we might approach it differently or might we might think about it a little bit differently, but at least we're talking, we're speaking the same language. And for that, it starts to become very, very important to have some sort of labels for this. Okay. But labels come with disadvantages as well. Okay. One psychological uh, conditions are very, very difficult to get reliability across individuals. So uh, if you're someone like myself who has a PhD in clinical psychology, I spent a lot of time working with and thinking about uh, what is disorder, what are symptoms of a disorder, how I did, how do I def identify this uh, this disorder versus this other disorder, uh, do some a lot of work in differential diagnosis. And so uh, sort of being sort of having some pretty good standards for sort of understanding sort of when something exists or when it doesn't, right? Uh, but if I'm going out to sort of your just a general practitioner out in the world, uh, if I go to one person, they may say, yeah, I have this. And another person says, yeah, I don't have this, right? So if I, let's say, let's say I've struggled with social anxiety, okay? And I go out into the universe and I uh, meet up with one clinician. And they say, yep, you meet uh, criteria for social anxiety disorder, right? say, okay, but then maybe I go to somewhere else and someone says, mm, I don't think it's social anxiety disorder. I think it's just depression. You're not able to get out of bed, engage with people. Uh, and so now I've got two different diagnoses sort of based on the same set of symptoms, depending on who I've talked to. Right. And so it starts to get hard to tack down um, these types of diagnoses to do this well. You need to spend a lot of time with a clinician and sort of going through and asking a lot of questions, stuff that doesn't often happen in uh, doctor's offices and, and other situations. And so uh, reliably getting down a diagnosis can be can be difficult. We also see problems with uh, stigma and social injustice. Right. There are certain types of uh, uh disorders, things like bipolar disorder, or borderline personality disorder, alcohol substance use that carries with it a, a great deal of stigma. Um, and if you have in your medical record that you've been identified or diagnosed with bipolar disorder, that's going to carry implications in terms of how other people interact with you and sort of how they interpret sort of your uh, reported difficulties and things along those lines, right? Um, and so for some of these difficulties, right, we can going back to the reliability issue, I can get uh, differences, let's say, um, oh, Jordan, right now you're in my in my uh, line of view. If I say Jordan has uh, um, spider phobia, let's say, okay. Um, or how about this? Let's say blood injection phobia. Let's say Jordan has blood injection phobia. Uh, and he comes to me and I say, yeah, Jordan has blood injection phobia because he has impairment and distress related around sort of getting shots and things like that. Uh, but then Jordan goes to somewhere else and they, I don't know that Jordan has blood injection phobia. He's certainly concerned about it, but it's not causing enough impairment, uh, for him to so that it's not impacting his life. So, uh, clinician number two says Jordan doesn't meet uh, criteria for, uh, uh, blood injection phobia. This is a discrepancy that probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference to anybody, right? But uh, if Jordan comes into me and it says, hey, I haven't been able to sleep and I'm just feeling really anked up, amped up, and I'm Joe General Physician and I say, oh, that sounds like bipolar disorder. Now, all of a sudden, based on uh, Jordan's report of lack of sleep and um, uh, feeling amped up, uh, now, all of a sudden, maybe he's got a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and is on mood stabilizers. That's a big deal, right? If we were to go through and sort of do a proper evaluation, we might find that really what's happened is Jordan's just feeling anxious, has some stuff. He's not sleeping. Uh, maybe there are external stressors that account for why he's uh, worked up and not able to sleep and sort of has been sort of hyper-focused on something, right? Now we've got a big difference, a big deal. Um, diagnoses of that nature should only be made by people who are well qualified and specialized in that. Um, you know, uh, I'm not diagnosing cancer on anybody who's coming into my, uh, uh, office because that's not my job. I'm not trained to do that. Um, people start throwing around diagnoses, uh, pretty easily sometimes, and that can start to have a problem for, uh, stigma and, and sort of injustice and sort of access and sort of care stuff down the road. Okay. A third thing, uh, we can start to see, uh, stuff with, um, self-fulfilling prophecies, right? If 
I'm struggling, right? And I have been told that I have borderline personality or bipolar disorder. Uh, what people can start to do is we start to internalize that a little bit, right? You hear people say, I'm bipolar, right? Well, I would say you're not bipolar. Like you physically are not the embodiment of bipolar. You may have symptoms that are consistent with a bipolar disorder and we can go through and we can manage those, right? But you yourself, you know, the same thing, I'm depressed, right? Like I'm a depressed person. Well, you may struggle with this, but that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, who you are and sort of reduce opportunities. And so, but sometimes there's an internalizing that happens. People will sometimes uh, grasp, latch onto these uh, diagnoses in ways that are sometimes not helpful. Uh, and so again, sort of one of the arguments for a disadvantage of uh, some of these labels. So again, um, with a lot of this stuff, this is sort of health records and, and things to be taken seriously. Um, diagnoses are important because they sort of start to identify, uh, you know, these collection of symptoms and difficulties that people are having, um, but always wanting, like anything else, to make sure that they're done, put within context, uh, and that whoever's uh, receiving the uh, evaluation sort of understands kind of what, what this means and what the implications are and things like that. So uh, to try and reduce uh, some of these other uh some of these other areas. Okay. Um, I think that's it on pros and cons of labeling. Any questions? Feeling good about this? Okay, cool. Uh, lecture summary, make sure you go through, take a look at that. Uh, whoops, comprehension check, make sure you go through, take a look at that. Uh, if you have any questions on uh, any of those issues, go ahead and let me know. All right, gonna switch gears. Talk about anxiety disorders, okay? Things that are creepy and scare us, like people in Easter bunny suits. There's never been a good, there's never been a good Easter bunny suit in the history of the universe where it's like, oh yeah, now that seems cool. Um, so anxiety, uh, sort of an area that I uh, specialize in. Um, and so again, like anything else, thinking about how do we conceptualize, think about anxiety. What is anxiety? Okay. Um, in general, if we're talking about anxiety, broadly speaking, uh, thinking about some tense and unsettling application of a threatening, but potentially vague event, uneasy feeling of suspense. Okay. If we're talking about anxiety, just, I'm just feeling anxious. Uh, there's, I'm feeling unsettled. Um, I'm feeling uneasy. There's a sense of sus There's this threat out there in the world. But when, if I'm feeling anxious, sort of thinking about this as sort of something out there in the universe that could get me at some point in time. Okay. And what we do is we often think about, uh, anxiety is based on this continuum between fear and, th uh, on a continuum of, of fear and threat. All right. And depending on where we're at in terms of this level of fear and threat, we start to see different things happen in terms of physiologically what's going on and also some implications for uh, uh, management and, and treatment and things. Okay. So at the low end of this fear threat continuum, we have worry. Okay. Think about worry as associated with a potential for threat. Okay. Um, if I'm worried and think about this, if, if you're worried about something it generally means that there's something out there off in the distance. There's a potential threat. It's not a real threat. It's something that could come up. It's down the road. Uh, and I'm just kind of anxious about this. I'm kind of worrying. I'm thinking about it. A lot of rumination, right? A lot of uh, uh, thinking about what if, what am I going to do, this, that, or the other type of thing. And what we see in worry, right, for that distant threat we see a reduction in autonomic arousal. So if I'm looking at physiologically what's happening in your body, if you're worrying, sort of counterintuitive, we actually see in several indices a drop in autonomic arousal, okay? And the idea is that uh, this reduction is sort of taking resources out, out away from sort of physiologically getting yourself all worked up and sort of uh, uh, directing that energy towards planning, okay? So this is often when we see individuals who struggle with chronic levels of worry, right? Here we see a lot of rumination, a lot of thinking, a lot of planning out all the possible scenarios. 
uh, and generally what we see at this level where the fear or where the threat is some distance off a reduction in autonomic arousal and again this more ruminative planning But as that threat starts to approach, what we start to see is a transition into anxiety, okay? Um, as this thing that I'm worried about has now gotten closer in space and time, what I might start to see is an increase in anxiety, okay? Uh, anxiety, what we see is start that automatic arousal, that autonomic arousal, uh, that those physiological response, that starts to increase, right? Uh, and sort of the idea is this is starting to get uh, organism ready for this fight or flight response. Like down the road, right? You know, there's, there's something. So maybe I'm sort of, I'm going out on a hike, right? Um, and... I'm kind of worried about bears. Like, oh boy, what am I going to do if I see a bear? What happens if we were going to bears? Like, so what's going on? Things along these lines. What's what's going to happen? You know, so I'm worrying, right? And then we go out on this hike. And so we're walking along on the trail. And then I see a sign that says, hey, bear country, watch out. Now, all of a sudden, now I'm sort of not worrying. This thing is, this potential threat has gotten closer. I'm feeling anxious. Sort of my heart rate starts to increase. Maybe I sort of uh, started to get uh, some more adrenaline in my body. This threat is starting to approach uh transitioning into fear this is immediate threat this thing that i've been worried about is right here in front of me right i've no longer just seen bears uh sort of watch out for bear i'm actually like see off in the distance there is a bear right it's here it's immediate uh and what we see with fear this full fight or flight response um and at this point limited uh, uh resources available for for cognitive processing if i'm in a panic uh, if I'm in the worst, uh, at least from what I perceive, the worst danger of my life, if sort of things are here right in my face to attack me, sort of my ability to go through and game plan and think about things, that's gone out the window, right? I'm a full physiological fight or flight reaction here, okay? And so when we're thinking about uh, sort of this continuum, right? On uh, the low end, we've got worry this general sense of tension and unease about something that might come up. And as that thing gets closer and closer and closer, uh, sort of increasing, you sort of transition into anxiety all the way up to fear, panic. Um, and so here down in the worry, cognitive resources, doing a lot of thinking, sort of planning things out, like what if stuff, immediate threat, all that's out the window, straight up fight or flight response. Okay. And this starts to have different differences in terms of uh, the types of uh, uh, different conditions that we see and the impact on uh, treatment prognosis, right? Um, if you're terrified of, let's say, driving, right, that's a pretty easy target. And we've got pretty good treatments to go through and go through and reduce your fear and anxiety of being in a car, right? We do exposure therapies. We have you go through and practice and drive and things like that. And eventually your fear will come down, right? Um, same thing with social anxiety or sort of lots of other types of things. Um, but we've got other types of uh, conditions that are more marked by worry, right? Um, it, I, I'm just generally worried about lots of different things, right? Uh, I what if myself to death, right? And sort of if I'm starting to worry about what if, what if, what if these things happen, then, you know, I start to get irritable, I start to be able to lose sleep, I get, I get uh, tense, I get restless, um, uh, you know, I can't concentrate on things. That low-level worry is, in a lot of cases, a harder thing to treat because sort of that thing that I'm worried about isn't here. It may never get here. It's just something off in the distance, right? So it's hard to go through and expose you to sort of this thing because... And also some of the things you might be worried about, we wouldn't want to expose you to. Like I'm worried about financial collapse, right? Or I'm worried that my relationship will end. Or I'm worried about lots of things that would be terrible and we don't want them to happen, right? But uh, if there's not any reason to worry about that right now or that worry is causing uh, too much distress or causing you not to do other things that you wouldn't want to do, then it starts to become problematic. But it's just this general vague what-if type of thing that becomes a little bit harder to treat, right? It's more, it's more sort of this worry cloud as opposed to me being afraid of this specific thing. And so it starts to become a little bit uh, more chronic and difficult to manage as opposed to some of the stuff that would seem worse off, this sort of a, this immediate threat panic response. Um, but at least that's got a target we can work on. Questions about Sort of this conceptualization of anxiety is, is sort of being on this uh, 
a continuum of, of worry, anxiety, fear. Comfortable with this? So, regardless of which of those three you tend to have more emphasis in, it just sort of gets categorized as an anxiety disorder. Yeah, yeah, because it all kind of falls. Uh, it all kind of falls on that dimension, right? Uh, this dimension of general worry and anxiety, uh, fear about some situations. Now, uh, if we wanted to do a deep dive into research on this uh, stuff, then it starts to get. Uh, some interesting questions on the extent to which we can tease apart reliably what uh, uh, anxiety versus sort of depression and things along those lines, because they tend to go hand in hand. But um, from a straight uh, sort of kind of conceptual standpoint for these anxiety disorders, uh, these are all conditions, and they've shifted around a little bit, uh, but these are all conditions that we generally think about as having, or at least marked by some level of fear, anxiety in terms of the presentation. Does that help? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Any other questions? I've heard that um, anxiety and stress can actually like physically hurt your body by releasing chemicals like cortisol and damaging things into your body. Is there any truth behind that? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, chronic anxiety is terrible for your body. Um, it's just not good, right? Uh, being awash in stress hormones constantly um, is not good at all for you. Right now, Will, this is the thing, right? And so when we get into panic stuff, right, people will often, often people who struggle with panic will often end up in the emergency room because they say, I'm going to have a heart attack and die, right? Panic won't kill you, okay? It's incredibly uncomfortable and it's incredibly scary, but acutely it's not going to kill you. But over the long term, right? If I'm constantly just soaked in anxiety and stress and things like that, uh, you know, long-term health outcomes are, it's associated with poor long-term health outcomes, right? So we get things like ulcers and headaches and loss of sleep and sort of all sorts of physiological complaints. A lot of times people will come in and say, uh, when we're working with folks, some of that somatic stuff, some of the physical stuff is kind of the big thing. People will come in and say, oh, I've got all these health problems. Um, which a lot of the health problems are probably just uh, at least in part influenced by just being constantly under just uh, a wash in stress hormones all the time. So uh, yeah, particularly with anxiety, strong connection between physical health, not in terms of like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get too, I'm going to get too stressed out and I'm going to, you know, have a heart attack. Not like that, but just long term, it's just pretty caustic and, and, and not good physiologically. Oh, okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Other questions? All right. So, so why study anxiety? Why focus on this stuff, right? Um, well, when we're looking at anxiety, if we're looking at clinical levels of anxiety, uh, super, super common. Okay. Uh, when we're looking at lifetime prevalence of clinical levels of anxiety, probably upward of 25%. Lifetime prevalence just means that at some point over the course of a person's lifetime, at least here in the U.S., about 25, about a quarter of people will at some point experience clinical levels of anxiety at some point over their lifetime. Now, that's not going to say that it's going to be chronic and forever, but at least at some point, uh, having levels of anxiety that are at a clinical, that would be of clinical note or significance uh, uh, at some point. Okay. So incredibly common. Um, we also see uh, anxieties being very chronic in many cases. Okay. So if we, so with research, um, looking at, for those individuals who come in for treatment for an anxiety disorder, right, or for some type of anxiety, uh, maybe, excuse me, not treatment, just sort of coming in and sort of been noted with uh, having some sort of anxiety-related disorder. Uh, if we follow those individuals over a period, an extended period, uh, in sort of this study up to eight years, um, depending on what type of anxiety we're looking at, we're seeing natural remission rates between 17 to 30 percent over eight years, okay? So what, what, is, what does this mean? If natural remission of anxiety is only about 17 to 30 percent. Most folks don't recover without some sort of active problem. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. What we're seeing is like, if I don't do anything about it, if I don't get active treatment, probably now 17 to 30 percent of people, that anxiety just kind of goes away on its own. But for the vast majority of folks, that anxiety just kind of hangs out. It's chronic. It just it doesn't go away. What people will start to do is build their lives around anxiety. Right. Um, I am anxious about driving, so I don't drive. Right. Um, I only shop within sort of walking distance of my place or have even any, if I need to go anywhere, have someone uh, have to drive me. Or if there's something that goes beyond what I can get, then I just skip it because, uh, oh, it's not that important anyway. I can come up with a lot of justifications for why this is a better system than what I had before. But if we're looking at it objectively, it's it's impairment, right? I've built my life around sort of these things that make me anxious and avoiding certain types of things. And so we see that once uh, this starts to happen, uh, it tends to be fairly chronic. Okay. Uh, anxiety is also expensive. Uh, estimates of about 30% of total mental health care costs uh, going towards some sort of anxiety uh, related condition. And so this makes sense uh, because uh, this collection of conditions is just so pervasive. Big, big chunk in terms of mental health care costs. Also a risk factor for other types of disorders. Okay. Um, what we see is that uh, if we're looking at individuals with untreated anxiety disorders, estimates of about two thirds of those individuals with untreated anxiety go on to develop additional mood or substance use disorders. Okay. But if we flip this around, right, if we go through and take a look uh, of those individuals with uh, depression, only about 18% of 18 of people with depression go on to develop uh, some additional anxiety disorder, okay? So two-thirds of individuals with anxiety go on to develop depression or substance use stuff. Only 18% of people with depression go on to, de uh, in, uh, to um develop additional anxiety disorders. So what, do, what does this say about sort of risk in terms of anxiety? I've kind of got an imbalance in this direction, right? Um, if I have anxiety and I don't, and it's untreated and I don't do anything about it, sort of I have a very high likelihood of going on to develop depression sort of mood or substance use disorder. Um, if I have uh, untreated depression, so there's still an increased risk of going on to develop anxiety but it's a disorder, but not nearly as much as the other way around, right? Um, and so anxiety being uh, seen as a huge, huge risk for um, uh, sort of other types of subsequent difficulties. And when we're working with people who struggle with anxiety difficulties, oftentimes we see lots of other types of disorders. I just rarely is it, I just have one thing. I've got things in a number of different domains that tend to come up, right? And so again, going back to this idea, uh, so this uh, acknowledgement of how expensive anxiety is, is the sort of estimated cost of uh, anxiety greater than the cost of uh, mood disorders, schizophrenia all put together, okay? Uh, these are uh, uh, disorders that are associated with uh, lots of uh, treatment, sort of medical costs, uh, sort of loss of jobs, uh, huge impairment. So hugely, hugely impactful um, and associated with pretty substantial reductions in quality of life. Okay. Um, and again, what we had talked about before, when we're thinking about uh, quality of life, this can be objective quality of life, right? Like, do I make enough money to pay my bills? Do I have a home? Do I... Um, can I put gas in my car? Can I put food on my table? That type of thing. And then also subjective quality of life, right? Like, am I happy? Do I have friends? Do I feel supported? Do I, uh, feel like I'm doing something, uh, functional with my life, right? Uh, reductions in both objective and, uh, subjective, uh, domains of, of quality of life. Um, and even sub-threshold stuff, right? We talked about in the previous, so when we're talking about disorders, right? Um, our threshold for diagnoses has some semi-arbitrary cut points, right? So for even those individuals, let's say I have OCD, right? Or symptoms of OCD. It's not enough for me to meet criteria for OCD, but even those subclinical levels of OCD, I don't, I don't technically meet, I can't don't have a diagnosis, but uh, those symptoms that I do have still associated with reductions of quality of life, right? 
Uh, maybe I have post-traumatic stress or symptoms of post-traumatic stress. I don't meet criteria for full-on PTSD, but those symptoms that I do have still contributing to reductions in life satisfaction, um, sort of job attainments so of all sorts of different things that can go on here. Okay, so huge associations with reductions in quality of life. But the good news is we've been very, very successful in treating many, many different types of anxiety. Uh, we have a good understanding of what anxiety is. We understand how it works. Um, and we've got a number of really good models uh, and sort of different programs that uh, demonstrate that on average, uh, people who go through complete and adhere to these uh, treatment protocols uh, do go through and can see substantial reductions in anxiety. So not only is this a problem, uh, lots of uh, distress and impairment associated with uh, this collection of disorders uh, related to anxiety, but we're also uh, pretty good at, at, at going through and being able to treat these um, with uh, some evidence-based psychosocial interventions. So does that remission have to do with people who didn't go through those treatments? Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, exactly. And so the idea is, you know, um, if, like a lot of things, um, uh, a lot of our uh, psychological con uh, conditions will have kind of a waxing and waning um, trajectory. Like sometimes they're bad and then things are around me are getting good, uh, less stress, and so I'm doing better. And then sometimes things will kind of go back up, right? Um, but when we're talking about natural remission, right, we're getting a group of individuals with different types of anxiety and then following up. So these are individuals who aren't getting treatment and we're just following up eight years to see is that does this person still have sort of this condition or meet criteria for this condition eight years later? Uh, if they don't, then we would say there was a natural remission to that. Um, but what we see with this anxiety, with uh, most types of anxiety, tends to be pretty chronic, right? And so in the absence of treatment, it's likely to just kind of continue on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions about this? Okay, cool. Uh, let's jump into some specific types of, of conditions. Now, the tricky thing about anxiety is we always, 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 in order to diagnose these and sort of understand what we're working with, we need to be uh, thinking about uh, the focus of fear with each one of these conditions. When I t talk about the focus of fear, I'm talking about for each condition, like what specifically is this person afraid of? Like what is the source of anxiety? What is the feared outcome? Um, because if I don't know that, it's really, really hard for me to determine what type of diagnosis or what type of uh, uh, a difficulty I'm working with here. Okay. And we'll give you some examples of kind of what that sort of looks like uh, down the road. But, or let's say, let's say, uh, Jonathan, you come in and you say, Hey, Dr. Clapp, I'm afraid of going to stores. I can't go shop. I need to go get groceries, but I can't shop at the grocery store. It makes me terrified. Okay. Um, what diagnosis do you have? I don't know, right? It could be a lot of things. What we need to figure out is what specifically is the focus of that concern, right? What are you afraid will happen if, let's say, I can't go to Walmart, right? Like, what am I afraid is going to happen there, right? As we start to get down to sort of getting at exactly what you're afraid of, that's when we're able to start to refine sort of what type of uh, sort of difficulty or, or condition we might be working with, which is going to help us focus treatment, okay? So, if we're thinking about kind of what we might think about is kind of the most basic uh, sort of type of, of anxiety disorder, talking about our phobias, okay? A specific phobia, this is going to be clini clinically significant anxiety provoked by a specific feared object or situation, often resulting in avoidance, okay? Um, now, we can uh, diagnose a specific phobia just based on distress, um, but generally what we're going to see at clinical levels is people are avoiding situations uh, these specific situations or objects in a way that goes through and starts to impact their life in some way. Okay. So lifetime prevalence of specific phobia. Again, when we're, whenever we're talking about lifetime prevalence, it means at some point over the course of the lifetime, uh, 13, close to 14% of the population estimated to meet criteria for, uh, a, a specific phobia, but, uh, estimates, uh, for this is, are going to change depending on what type of phobia that we're talking about 
and sort of the threshold that's used to determine uh, diagnoses. So, for example, let's say that, uh, Cameron, you're afraid of flying, right? You really don't like to fly, all right? Um, but you will fly. You white knuckle it, and you need to have probably two or three drinks before you get on the plane, before you're able to go through and do it, but you can do it, right? Now, does that meet criteria for specific phobia? I would say probably, even though you're doing it, you're not avoiding flying. If you have to have those three drinks before you get on the plane, and if you couldn't have those three drinks, then you wouldn't get on the plane, I would still say you have a flying phobia, right? Or sort of maybe you get on, you're sort of nervous, you don't like it, you're kind of anxious, but if I asked was anybody around you, could they tell if you're anxious? You'd be like, no, nah, I'm able to hide it pretty good. I just really don't like it. I'll do it, but I really don't care for it. Then I say, you got some flying fear, but maybe it does, doesn't meet criteria for uh, a disorder, right? So depending on where, but someone say, oh, yeah, no, if you're in distress for the whole flight, then we're still going to call that a disorder. So it starts to get sort of that uh, reliability piece, like where do we draw the line, right? Um, so these lifetime estimates will uh, jump around depending on uh, the criteria that we're using and what type of phobia we're using. So when we're thinking about our specific phobias, we generally think about a, a number of different types, okay? Um, so uh, we've got animal type, uh, specific phobia animal type. This is gonna be snakes, spiders, dogs, sort of stuff, right? Just animals, a lot of times it's creepy crawlies, right? Um, and just being anxious about this stuff doesn't mean that you meet criteria for a phobia, right? I don't like spiders. Like I dislike them a great deal. They gross me out, right? But there's nothing in my life. If I see a spider, I'd kill a spider. Um, if I see a spider, I don't run out of my house or I don't set off uh, chemicals and sort of won't come back in until it's done, right? Uh, I've got sheds in my backyard. I don't not put things there because I might be afraid that spiders might be there, right? So I don't have, I have spider fear, spider anxiety. I don't have a spider phobia, right? And if I have a spider phobia, I don't go in basements, I don't go in attics, I don't go in sheds, I don't go any place where a spider might be. I can't kill a spider. If I see a spider, I can't be back in the room until I verify that it's been killed. So these are the types of things that start to look like uh, phobia level stuff, okay? So we've got our animal type. Uh, we've got natural environment type. This is gonna be fear of things like storms, heights, water, uh, things along these lines. Um, blood injection injury type, okay? Uh, this is going to be fear of needles, uh, medical procedures, things along those lines, okay? Um, now, blood injection injury type of phobia has a very specific and kind of unique uh, reaction for people who have blood, inje uh, blood injection uh, phobias. What happens to people with blood injection phobias? What do they do? Pass out. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is something that's interesting. This uh, vasovagal response, about 75% of individuals uh, with clinical levels of blood injection uh, phobia, um, what we see with these individuals when uh, confronted with the sight of blood or needles or some other medical procedure, uh, see an acceleration of heart rate, uh, an elevation of uh, blood pressure, followed by a significant and immediate drop. And what people do, psh, they faint. Okay. Um, in treating blood injection phobia, there's actually sort of techniques with sort of muscle tension and uh, sort of same thing that fighter pilots do. So they don't pass out from G-force, right? Trying to tense muscles to keep blood in your head uh, so that you don't pass out. It's a, sort of a technique that's kind of unique to uh, treatment of blood injection phobia type so that people don't uh, just sort of faint away. But really, really important, right, is sort of working with people with clinical levels of this, uh, will need to go into the doctor's office, but will not go to the doctor or the dentist for fear that they might get an injection or just because of sort of fear of, of medical procedures to the point I'm in intense pain and I should have been in the hospital a long time ago, but I'm not because I'm afraid of going in, right? I've uh, worked with people with dental phobia who do their own dental work, which seems like a horrible, horrible thing, but like, no, I would rather slam a bunch of alcohol and get a pair of pliers and pull this tooth out of my head, then go into the, the dentist and have them do it, right? So this can get pretty intense, all right? Uh, situational type phobia, this is going to be things like flying, driving, uh, bridges, enclosed places, right? Um, if you're living in the dorms and you can't get in the elevator, not because of pandemic COVID-related stuff, but I would rather walk 14 flights of steps 
uh, to get in an elevator because I can't handle that in closed places. This is situational type phobia. Okay. Then other type phobia, uh, this is going to be things like fear of choking, vomiting, um, illness, things like that. These are things no one likes, right? Uh, but what we'll see is individuals starting to restrict their eating um, or having very rigid rules about what they'll eat or how they're going to go eat to, to avoid choking, right? Or, uh, you know, no one is jazzed about vomiting, but uh, my, I have an intense fear of vomiting and sort of if I see vomiting related stuff, it's not just a disgust, sort of an intense fear reaction. It can start to be problematic in some areas. Okay. Um, so if we're thinking about folks in the community, right, if we're just looking at uh, people with phobia out there in the world, um, generally seeing animal phobia as our most common um, with our natural environment being the least common, right? So people are afraid of dogs, spiders, wasps, creepy crawlies. That happens quite a bit. Uh, fear of storms, water, um, heights being less prominent in terms of what people are reporting out in the community. Uh, for clinical stuff, though, when people are coming in, um, what we do see there is uh, increase in situational phobia, um, natural environment, blood injection, um, these types of things, okay? Um, what we generally see is uh, these phobias are rarely the presenting issue, right? People are generally coming in for treatment for some other type of thing. Um, but if we're going through and asking about other types of stuff that's going on, a lot of uh, sort of these phobias kind of hang on the background, okay? But when they are, uh, the focus of clinical, uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, presentation a lot of times like situational type, it's driving phobia. Like I can't drive. I can't make it around and do things that normally normal people do because I can't drive. I'm terrified of driving. When I the thought of getting in a car, it about gives me a panic attack, right? Um, or, uh, you know, I am, I have a blood injection phobia. I have a medical condition. I need to be going into the doctor, but I can't because I'm terrified of giving shots or things along those lines. And so uh, this is starting to cause uh, high levels of impairment. So um, <clears throat> in general, don't see uh, the specific phobia being often the, the, uh, the target of, of intervention, but there are things going on in the background that certainly aren't helping things a whole lot. Because again, what happens is people start to build their lives around um, around the phobia, right? So yeah, I just don't go anywhere that would require uh, a, me to go in a tall building because I can't go in elevators. So I just don't go to those places. Okay, well, if you're in Wyoming, maybe that's fine. But if you're not, if you're in a big city, maybe that starts to severely restrict the types of places you can go, right? Or I don't drive. Um, I have my uh, spouse drive me or my friends drive me. And it's fine, they don't mind. Like, no, trust me, they do mind. Uh, if you can't drive from point A to point B, or, you know, I don't drive on interstates. I just drive sort of locally. Yeah, it takes me sort of twice as long to get anywhere, um, but that's fine. I'll enjoy the scenery. Like, nope, what you've done is you've cut out a direct route from point A to point B based on your fear, and so we'd identify that as impairment. Yeah. A dark clap? Yeah. Uh, let's say there's a perceived phobia. Are there specific uh, disorders that perceived phobias could be a predicator for? What do you, uh, can you, can you tell me what you mean by perceived phobias? Uh, let's say someone comes in for an intense fear that doesn't really meet the threshold of a phobia. Okay. Like you were saying earlier, is that like a predicator for something specifically, or is that just like a general aspect of? Um, it, it, it could, I mean, it, it could, it could be like, you know, if I come in and I, uh, if I come in, maybe let's say, and we'll talk about this on Wednesday, social phobia, okay? Focus the fear of social phobia, social evaluation, right? Um, it's possible, you know, if someone comes in and say, oh, yeah, no, I'm sort of worried about, so I'm having a hard time going to these places because I'm afraid people are going to judge me or sort of think badly about me or something like that. I'll go. It just makes me uncomfortable. What we might find, um, so if we talk with them a little bit more, is maybe kind of really what's going on is I've got some struggles with depression, right? And sort of it's a lot of this negative thought about, you know, you know I'm, I'm worthless, I'm not any good, 
Should I have nothing to contribute, right? And so what might look like social phobia kind of on the surface is actually better understood as some depression types of things, right? Um, or maybe someone says, oh, you know, I'm having a hard time going to get shopping at the mall or something or shopping at the store if no one goes to malls anymore. Um, but I'm sort of have a hard time doing my grocery shopping. And so I like, okay, well, why is that back? Like, well, you know, I just, uh, you know, anxious about it. Right. But then you go through and it sounds like there's some panic stuff going on. Right. So, um, this is why some of those comprehensive diagnostics are start to become important because it can, if I don't know, if I, if I don't ask, I'm not going to know. And so it's sort of get kind of that big picture to try and understand what's going on behind some of this stuff. But what we'll often see too, is if uh, someone comes in and they're struggling with, you know, some depression or uh, some traumatic stress or alcohol substance use or things along those lines, what we see is subclinical symptoms of other stuff going on, kind of hanging out in the background. Um, cause these anxiety disorders, the mood disorders kind of ride together. So, yeah. Um, uh, and sort of question in here, uh, were phobias the basis of the idea of collective, un collective unconscious? Yeah. Um, that started to come in particularly with, uh, sort of the commonalities across some of these, uh, phobias, animal type, right? Um, natural environment type, blood injection injury type, right? These are all, uh, these are all focus. The focus of these fears are things like sort of things that could harm us, right? Like, yeah, it's probably good to be afraid of some types of animals because in our history, like they might have sort of snakes. You don't want to screw around with snakes and spiders and stuff like that. They could bite you. And if there's not medical attention, that could be bad, right? Or it's probably not good to be hanging off of high places or screwing around in deep water uh, or sort of being in tight and closed places where I could suffocate and die, right? The sight of blood is probably not a good thing if my blood's all over the place and that's in a bad situation, right? And so this idea that we have these common uh, across cultures, you see these same types of fears coming back up sort of related to this idea of uh, this analytic idea of the collective unconscious sort of our human sort of shared consciousness and sort of wealth of memories and stories and things along those lines. And so, yeah, some of this stuff played into that. Now, the collective unconscious isn't something that has a any basis in science or, or sort of empirical stuff. But from a Jungian standpoint, that's kind of the idea where some of this this came up from. And that started, started to get into some of the, the more mystical sort of aspects of, of uh, psychoanalytic theory. But yeah, you're exactly right. That's kind of one of the things that was used as evidence for uh, collective unconscious. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, we're past time. Um, uh, so if you need to uh, take off, go ahead. But uh, any other questions that people have about uh, any of this stuff or where we're going in terms of class? People feeling A-OK? -okay? Cool. All right. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, good work. Go through. Uh, we'll pick up here on, I don't know, we're just going to, again, this is uh, stuff I think is interesting. It's fun to talk about. Um, so we're just kind of work through this stuff uh, casually through to the end of the semester. We'll hit what we can hit um, and kind of take things from there. Uh, go through, take a look, make sure that you're reading the modules. That's going to bring in a lot of other stuff that uh, uh, from the text that we're maybe not necessarily going to get into here. Um, and uh yeah we'll do that um let me know if you have any questions otherwise we'll catch you all on wednesday okay all right we'll see you folks